Hello, my name is Van de Keizer. I'm a neuroradiologist in Ghent University Hospital in Belgium. And this is a video presentation on imaging of the aging brain. In this video, I'm going to talk about the things you can see on neuroradiological studies of elderly patients, both normal patients, so the spectrum of normal age-related imaging abnormalities or imaging findings rather, and also what you can see in patients with dementia. Uh, this is going to be a pretty long presentation and it will probably end up being uploaded in two parts. And this first part is going to be mainly about how should you approach an imaging study of a patient suspected of having dementia or an elderly patient? How should you evaluate what you see? How should you judge cerebral atrophy, for instance? What is normal, what is abnormal for the age of the patient? And in a second presentation, I will work more uh, pathology-based and discuss the imaging findings and specific dementia syndromes like Alzheimer's disease or frontotemporal lobar degeneration. These will be briefly uh, addressed in this presentation, but if you want to see specific findings and specific diseases, that will be for a second presentation. So what are the topics of this presentation? I'm going to start with a brief introduction on what is dementia exactly. I'm going to discuss the role of imaging in dementia. I'm going to teach you how you should evaluate a CT or an MRI in an elderly patient, especially patients suspected of having dementia. And we'll discuss the broad spectrum of age-related imaging findings and discuss what can be considered normal or abnormal. So let's start with what is dementia? Well, first of all, dementia is basically an umbrella term. It does not refer to a specific disease. It refers to a collection of symptoms. And uh, what do these symptoms have in common? Whether there is a deterioration in uh, memory function or other cognitive functions of the patients that are beyond what can be expected from normal aging and that interfere with normal daily life. So dementia is not one disease. What are possible causes of dementia? Well, oops, I'm sorry. What are possible causes of dementia? Well, the most frequent one will be Alzheimer's disease followed by vascular dementia, dementia caused by chronic cerebrovascular disease. Then we have frontotemporal lobar degeneration, we have Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's disease dementia, which are pathologically uh, strongly related to one another. We have mixed dementia, which basically means that a patient can have, from a pathological point of view, several of these diseases at the same time. So a patient can have uh, vascular disease and Alzheimer's disease at the same time, and both will contribute to the dementia syndrome. And then we have some less frequent causes of dementia, like, for instance, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, but there are many others. Uh, these are so-called progressive dementias, which means that these patients will have progressive symptoms because they have a progressive neurodegenerative the neurodegenerative disease. And most of these diseases are caused by neuronal loss secondary to the intra or extracellular deposition of specific abnormal proteins. We also have non-progressive dementias. And what are these? These are patients with dementias in which the dementia is caused by a chronic but non-progressive structural brain lesion. For instance, patients with widespread uh, tissue loss following a traumatic brain injury, just to give you an example. And we also have so-called reversible dementias, which are dementias that are caused by a wide variety of potentially reversible conditions. For instance, a chronic subdural hematoma, metabolic disorders, uh, drug intoxications or side effects of medications. Um, in some cases, normal pressure hydrocephalus can be a reversible or a reversible cause of dementia and so on. In this presentation, we will mainly talk about progressive dementias. And progressive dementias, as I already said, most are caused by the abnormal accumulation of certain proteins. For instance, in Alzheimer's disease, if you look at the brain pathologically, you can see abnormal extracellular plaques of amyloid beta protein, and you can see intracellular tau proteins. And frontotemporal lobe degeneration, you can find tau proteins, TDP-42, and FUS-FET. Uh, alpha synucleins 
or what we find in Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's disease dementia and in Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease, we will find abnormal prion proteins. As you see on this slide, you can have several of these proteins in the same disease. For instance, you can find amyloid beta and tau and Alzheimer's disease. And on the other hand, certain syndromes like frontotemporal lower degeneration can be caused by uh, several abnormal proteins like tau, TDP43, and thus fat. Uh, what is also important is that in many of these progressive neurodegenerative diseases, uh, if you look at it pathologically, there is a certain spatiotemporal evolution of the disease spread. For instance, in an early stage Alzheimer's disease, you can find uh, abnormal tau proteins in the mesotemporal region, more specifically in the anterior cortex, so the part of the mesotemporal lobe in front of and underneath the hippocampus, and that will spread to involve other areas of the limbic system, and finally will involve most of the cerebral cortex. Another example is the deposition of uh, alpha-synucleins in Parkinson's disease dementia or Lewy body disease, and this typically starts in the olfactory bulb, as you can see here, and in certain areas of the lower brainstem before spreading to the upper brainstem and finally spreading to involve most of the neocortex. And this is not uh, unimportant because it will help us understand certain imaging findings. For instance, in a patient with Alzheimer's disease, the structure we are most interested in as radiologists has the mesotemporal region, because that region is first involved in the disease and will uh, first show signs of atrophy. We won't see abnormal mesotemporal atrophy in a patient with Lewy body dementia, for instance. We can see it in the final stage when most of the brain is involved, but we won't see it in an early stage. And the role of imaging is mainly to detect early dementias. So you have to be aware of what disease is suspected clinically and where, what structures does that disease initially involve. Now, the diagnosis of dementia is not easy because I talked a bit about pathology. And in the end, the only way to be 100% certain of what specific disease a patient has is by pathological examination, by performing biopsy. Of course, that won't be done, especially because uh, in most of these diseases, uh, therapeutic options are unfortunately limited. So the diagnosis of dementia is basically a puzzle. It relies on the anamnesis or heteroanamnesis of the patient. It relies on clinical and cognitive evaluation of the patient. In some cases, it will rely on the findings in the cerebrospinal fluid or specific findings on EEG. Um, nuclear uh, medicine investigations play an important role in the evaluation of patients with dementia, but I will not discuss that because I am not, um, I have no background in nuclear medicine. I will talk about what you can see on radiological studies like MRI or CT. And these studies, in the end, are just part of the puzzle. And that's important to keep in mind. In some cases, you will be able to offer a quite specific diagnosis. But in a lot of cases, our role is mainly to identify normal versus abnormal atrophy and maybe pinpoint to some specific findings, like, for, for instance, early mesotemporal atrophy or asymmetrical frontotemporal atrophy to the clinician who will put that piece of the puzzle uh, and try to fit it, try to fit that piece of the puzzle with the rest of the puzzle pieces to come to a diagnosis. So what can we conclude? What is dementia exactly? Well, it's a syndrome. It's not one disease. It's a group of disorders which can be quite heterogeneous. And the diagnosis, if you want to have an exact diagnosis, would rely on a biopsy, which is impossible. So we rely on a lot of investigations, including imaging, which then provides part of the puzzle. So I always tell my residents, uh, be careful before saying this, uh, what we see here is compatible with Alzheimer's disease. Just point out if it's normal or abnormal. If you do that, you've already done a lot for your referring neurologists. So what is the role of imaging exactly? I already told it a bit. Um, well, 
it used to be mainly this, the exclusion of treatable causes, which can be a brain tumor, especially if the brain tumor is located in the frontal lobes, like in this patient with a large olfactory groove meningioma, a normal pressure hydrocephalus, or a chronic subdural hematoma. Well, it used to be, that used to be the main task of imaging, but it has evolved to the detection of specific abnormalities or specific findings, like what is the degree and the pattern of cerebral atrophy, what structures are most involved, what is the degree of cerebrovascular damage, and do you see anything specific, like, for instance, a lot of microbleeds or diffusion restriction in certain areas, which can be suggestive of one specific disease, namely Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease. And as radiologists, we have a toolbox we can use to evaluate our patients. We can evaluate them on CT or MRI or the boat. And if we do MRI, we can perform several sequences, all of which will offer us a valuable and a very specific bit of information. And what are this? I will show you in a minute. And to evaluate our imaging studies, we can use certain scales that have been validated, for instance, to uh, give an estimate on the degree of cerebral atrophy. It, that can be global cerebral atrophy, that can be mesotemporal atrophy, that can be parietal lobe atrophy, and I will demonstrate the most used scales and the best validated scales to do that. Now, CT or MRI? MRI, as a neuroradiologist, we always prefer MRI. Uh, it's a bit more uh, sensitive. We can see a bit more. We have uh, some added information, like we can see microbleed on T2 star images or uh, susceptibility-weighted images, and we can't do that with CT. But when it comes to evaluating the degree of cerebral atrophy or the degree of microvascular-wide uh, matter damage, CT and MRI are a bit similar in performance. If a patient has contraindications for MRI, then I think about the only thing you can only see on MRI and you won't be able to see on CT would be diffusion restriction if the patient is suspected of having Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease or would be microbleeds. So if MRI is for a variety of reasons not possible, CT is definitely a good alternative. Uh, Dan, how do you examine an MRI? Well, we have several sequences. We have our T2 and flare sequences, and we use those. Uh, we also, let's first show you uh, what sequences we perform in a study of a patient with dementia, and then tell you what they are used for. So we have T2 and flare sequences. We also do uh, 3D T1 weighted images, like an MPRH sequence, for instance, and then we, we format uh, to try the 3D data set and uh, several orthogonal planes and especially the coronal planes are very uh, important in a patient suspect of having dementia then we have susceptibility weighted images or t2 star images and we have diffusion weighted images and this would be an, a good protocol for an mri of a patient suspect of having dementia so t2 and flare uh, 3D T1 weighted images, susceptibility weighted images, or T2 star and diffusion weighted images. And what do we evaluate on these specific sequences? T2 and flare are mainly used to evaluate the extent of vascular white matter damage. On uh, the 3D T1 weighted images, we will evaluate the presence of global and or focal atrophy. The susceptibility weighted images or T2 star images are used for the detection of microbleeds and diffusion weighted images for areas of diffusion restriction, which is uh, especially important in patients suspected of having, I already said it several times, Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease. And this is an example of a patient with Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease. On the flare images, you can see some subtle signal increase in the basal ganglia and here medially and the thalamus on both sides. And we see that these areas are associated with an increased signal on the diffusion weighted images with a low signal on the ADC map, so corresponding to diffusion restriction. And here's the diagnosis. This was Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease. And this is another patient with Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease. And this patient, it doesn't involve the basal ganglia or the thalamus, but mainly the cerebral cortex. But more on the specific findings in Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease in my next presentation. Now, how should you systematically evaluate a CT or an MRI in a patient suspected of having dementia? Uh, 
Well, first of all, you need to exclude treatable causes like a chronic subdural hematoma or a brain tumor. Then you should judge global cerebral atrophy. So give an estimate on the global degree of atrophy in the patient before judging focal atrophy, for instance, in the mesial temporal lobe. And finally, you should evaluate the extent of vascular disease, uh, especially microvascular disease, so white matter changes in the brain. And these are some scales you can use. For global atrophy, you can use the global cortical atrophy scale. For focal atrophy, we have the parietal atrophy scale, also called the UDEM scale. And for the mesiotemporal region, we have the mesiotemporal atrophy scale, sometimes also called the Shelton's scale, uh, because uh, our Dutch colleagues have done a lot of great uh, work and evaluation of dementia and have given these scales their names. And finally, we can use the Faceta scale for the evaluation of the vascular white matter changes. Now, the global cerebral atrophy scale or the global cortical atrophy scale was originally described in uh, 1979. Uh, or 1997, rather. And originally, it was a very impractical scale because you needed to judge atrophy in 13 hemispheric brain regions for each cerebral hemisphere. And that has been abandoned. Nobody does it that way. It costs way too much time without adding a lot of additional information. And now it's simplified, and you judge atrophy basically in the frontal and parietal lobes above the levels of the lateral ventricles. So at the plane where you don't see the ventricles, just above it, uh, basically at the level of the centrum semiovale. And it's an ordinal scale that goes from grade zero to grade three. Now let's show you what a grade zero looks like. Basically in a grade zero, the patient has no visually detectable atrophy. And we have basically what we should call a normal image. In a grade one, we see some uh, dilatation of the sulci. So it's very mild, uh, it's not that spectacular, but nevertheless, we see a clear difference with the previous patient. Then a global, oh, my apologies. Then in a grade two, basically the sulcal dilatation has become more pronounced due to volume loss of the gyri. And in a global cerebral atrophy grade three, we have so-called end-stage atrophy or knife blade atrophy. And it's called knife blade atrophy because the gyri have become so atrophic that they look sharp as blades, hence knife blade atrophy. And I always teach my residents to not simply use the scales because let's say the referring physician as a general practitioner, maybe he is not aware of these scales and doesn't really know what they mean. So I always say, just call those mild, moderate, and severe before adding the exact scale, because well, it's an adjective. Um, it's an adjective rather uh, that describes it a bit, but it also gives an estimate on the degree or the severity of cerebral atrophy. So I always say uh, mild cerebral atrophy or mild cortical atrophy, uh, global cortical atrophy rate one, for instance. And if it's a grade three, I call it severe global cortical atrophy. Now, where should you judge your global cerebral atrophy? Never do it on T2-weighted images because you will always overestimate the degree of cerebral atrophy. Look at these T2-weighted images. At a first glance, you'd say, wow, this is really spectacular. This is probably going to be global cerebral global cortical atrophy grade three. We see so much space between the gyri, but we see a lot less space if we look at the flare images or if we look at the T1-weighted images, which are um, comparable. So always judge it on flare images or on T1-weighted images because you will overestimate it on T2. This was not global cortical atrophy grade three, this was a grade two. Um, so always judge it on flare or T1-weighted images. And here is another example. Here, we uh, would say that uh, the patient has some global cerebral atrophy. It looks rather mild, but it looks even milder if you look on the flare images. Here, I'd say there's only some mild atrophy in the parietal lobes on both sides compared to the two-weighted images. The next scale you should know is the mesiotemporal atrophy scale. And also here, you should evaluate mesiotemporal atrophy on flare or T1-weighted images. Look at these magnified images. So look at the hippocampi on both sides, because the mesiotemporal atrophy scale is a scale that we should use 
in coronal planes, um, and we should evaluate the hippocampal region, we'll look at the width of the choroid fissure on top of the hippocampus, it looks a lot wider on T2-weighted images compared to flare images or T1 images. So also here, evaluated on flare images or T1-weighted images. And in our institution, we don't do coronal flares and patients with dementia or suspected of having dementia, we do a 3D T1 set. So use your reformatted coronal T1-weighted images. Now, how should you evaluate it? Basically, you should look at three structures. Here with the blue arrow, you should look at the choroid fissure, the small uh, cerebrospinal fluid space above the hippocampus. You should look at the temporal horn, which is located laterally on the hippocampus, indicated by the red arrow. And finally, you should look at the height of the hippocampus. Now, and here uh, are some, uh, well, I already told this. Now, what should you look at first? Basically, the mesotemporal atrophy scale is also an ordinal scale, goes from grade zero to grade four. The first thing you look at, so you have a grade zero if everything looks normal. You have a grade one if there is some widening of the choroid fissure, but temporal horn and the hippocampal height are normal. You have a grade two if you have widening of the choroid fissure and that will have increased by now, and you also see some widening of the temporal horn, then you have a grade two. And you have a grade three, if you can visually detect moderate atrophy of the hippocampus and a grade four, if there is severe atrophy. Now, patients do not wake up, do not go to bed one evening with mesotemporal lobe atrophy grade one and wake up the next with mesotemporal lobe atrophy grade two. This is a continuous process and we are using an ordinal scale. So keep that in mind you will see gradual dilatation of the choroid fissure of the temporal horn accompanied by some hippocampal volume loss. Um, and sometimes it will be difficult to say, well, is this a grade one or grade two? There is some inter-observer variability, which is inherent to the use of ordinal scales to describe a continuous ongoing process like cerebral atrophy. Do not worry about that. Uh, it can be that your colleague will say it's a grade two to me and you say, well, it's a grade one. That's part of the process here. That's part of the game. Uh, the main thing is you should be able to distinguish or make the difference between, for instance, a grade four and a grade one. And you already are saying a lot of you can make if you can make that distinction. So let's show you some examples. This is a patient with mesotemporal lobe atrophy grade zero. These are magnified coronal P1-weighted images. And a grade one, oh, my apologies, my mouse is overly sensitive. So in a grade one, we will see some slight dilatation of the choroid fissure. In a mesotemporal lobe atrophy grade two, we will see progressive dilatation of the choroid fissure now accompanied by dilatation of the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle. In a grade three, we also see some moderate uh, height loss of the hippocampus, compare that with the normal patient. Of course, here there was already some atrophy of the hippocampus, because otherwise you would have no dilatation of the choroid fissure and the temporal horn. We call it the grade three when it really becomes visually apparent. And we call it the grade four when basically it's so severe that there's practically nothing left of the hippocampus. And here we see that there is severe widening of the temporal horn and also a lot of widening of the choroid fissure in this patient. And these are some examples. This is, uh, once again, mesotemporal lobe atrophy grade zero. This, oh, my apologies, my mouse is so sensitive. This is a grade one. So we see some dilatation of the choroid fissure on both sides. Then we go to grade two, where there is also some starting increase or dilatation of the temporal horn on both sides. And uh, mesotemporal lobe atrophy grade three, we see that there is now also more pronounced atrophy of the hippocampus compared to the grade two. And finally, in grade four, we have end stage hippocampal atrophy. And once again, I've already shown you this image. This is something you can also evaluate on CT. So CT definitely is not inferior if you just are familiar with these scales, if you practiced a lot with them, then you can also do it on CT. So you do not exactly need MRI to judge atrophy.
Then you have a very specific scale, the parietal lobe atrophy scale, also called the Pudam scale, which was designed specifically for the evaluation of the parietal lobe. And the parietal lobe is a structure that tends to be uh, preferentially involved in patients with early onset Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease manifesting before age 65. And the main structure is basically the preconius. So the part of the parietal lobe located uh, along the medial side of the cerebral hemisphere. And there are several key anatomical landmarks that you should uh, evaluate in a patient when uh, looking for parietal atrophy. And these are the, mar the marginal branch of the cingulate sulcus, which is located in front of the preconius. And then we have the parieto occipital sulcus, which is located along the posterior border of the preconius, and which is basically the border between the parietal lobe and the occipital lobe and the medial plane. And located between both these sulci, we have the preconius, the most medial part or the most medial gyrus of the parietal lobe. And the parietal uh, lobe atrophy scale basically works very similar to the global cortical atrophy scale. Uh, in a grade zero, you have nothing. In a grade one, you have some sulcal dilatation. In a grade two, you have progressive sulcal dilatation, more sulcal dilatation by, caused by chiral volume loss. And in a grade three, you have knife blade or end stage atrophy of the parietal lobe. And it's best evaluated in three planes. You could say, well, if you're used to doing it, I'm only doing it in the axial plane, but it's easier if you look at your three imaging planes. And what should you look for? Well, you should, of course, look at the marginal branch of the cingulate sulcus and the parieto occipital sulcus. And here we have the parieto occipital sulcus and the coronal plane. And underneath it, we have the calcarine sulcus. We should look at the pecunius, if there is gyral volume loss or not. And finally, we should look at the sulci along the parietal convexity, best done in the coronal and the axial planes. And in this patient with grade one, we see that compared to the patient with grade zero, there is some slight or some mild sulcal dilatation of the parietal occipital and the uh, marginal branch of the cingulate sulcus. Uh, we also see that, and we see some widening or sulcal dilatation along the parietal convexity, as well as dilatation of the parietal occipital sulcus. And finally, on the axial planes, we also see some mild sulcal dilatation. Now, I'm now going to compare a grade one with a grade two, because it's easier if you can compare it. And a grade two, we basically see the same as in a grade one, but it's more pronounced. We have more sulcal dilatation. It's as simple as that. And it's a bit subjective as to when to call it a grade one or a grade two, or you need some practice. But look at a grade one, look at a grade two. If you look at the, pari uh, the parietal convexities, it is more pronounced. We have some volume loss of the parietal gyri, causing more pronounced sulcal dilatation. We also see some more widening of the parietal occipital sulcus over here. My apologies. And once again, now in the axial plane, there is more pronounced sulcal dilatation of the um, parietal sul sulci along the cerebral convexities. Finally, a grade three, basically the same as for global cortical atrophy. We now have end stage or knife blade atrophy. We have very pronounced sulcal dilatation. And we see that the gyri of the parietal lobe and the coronal plane look razor sharp. So this is end stage parietal lobe atrophy. Look at this one. There's basically or practically no gyrus left. It's so thin. This is final stage atrophy. And here I'm comparing them on the axial planes. This is a, oh, I made a mistake. My apologies. This is a grade zero, not a grade one. This is a grade one, a grade two, and a grade three. I'm really sorry about this. This is a slide I added the last minute and I didn't double check it. So the Kudam scale goes from grade zero to grade three. Uh, then finally, the Faseca scale is a scale you can use for the evaluation of white matter changes. And I'm going to talk a bit more about it in the next section, but you can also already have an idea. So the Faseca scale can be used for periventricular white matter lesions and deep white matter lesions. And patients suspected of having atrophy, deep white matter lesions are what is important. And 
So this is the Fadika scale for deep white matter lesions and a grade one. You have some very small patchy or punctate white matter lesions. These become confluent and a grade two, and you have severe confluence and a grade three. Now I'm going to talk about the spectrum of normal and abnormal age-related findings and elderly patients. So what are we going to evaluate? We're going to talk about normal and abnormal cortical atrophy. We're going to talk about white matter changes, the presence of silent infarctions. You can, so you can see uh, the remains of an old infarction and a patient who has clinically never had a stroke. These are so-called silent infarctions and they are not that infrequent in the elderly. Uh, we're going to talk shortly about uh, verve of robin spaces or perivascular spaces, microbleed, and brain iron accumulation. We're going to start by talking about cortical atrophy. Now, what is normal brain atrophy? This is a study evaluating uh, the evolution of brain atrophy in normal aging. And what do we see? Well, between the ages of 30 to 50, uh, we lose about 0.2% of brain volume per year. And this process, so basically atrophy is a normal phenomenon. We can't escape it. And this process accelerates uh, starting at age 70. So between 70 and 80, we have 0.3 to 0.5% volume loss per year. And in patients above 70, uh, you have about 5% brain volume loss per decade without this being abnormal. And if we then compare the loss of gray matter compared to the loss of white matter, we see that white matter loss is actually more pronounced than gray matter loss, especially in elderly patients. Um, so this would be mark 70 about here. And we see that this increases exponentially after age 70. What can we do with that information as radiologists? Well, unfortunately, we cannot visually detect accelerated atrophy. That's too difficult. If we were to do a brain scan in a patient with dementia like every month or so, by using volumetric tools, we, we could probably measure the degree or the acceleration or the degree at which atrophy develops in a patient, but that's very difficult to do visually. And in daily radiological, radiological practice, we do not use volumetric tools. You are mainly used for uh, studies and scientific purposes. Now, this is a patient with abnormal atrophy. Patient has accelerated atrophy and in Alzheimer's disease, that would be about two to 3% per year. And here patients C and B have normal atrophy. And I already told you, and patients above 70, that's about 0.3 to 0.5% per year. How can we detect accelerated atrophy? Unfortunately, we can't. The only thing we can do is provide um, an evaluation at a specific point in time and say there is so much atrophy at this specific time by using the global cerebral atrophy scale. But even with that scale, we can say something. We can make suggestions about whether or not what we are looking at is normal or abnormal. So what is normal, what is abnormal? And I'm relying for a great deal on studies performed by the Rotterdam group um, under uh, Mieke Vernooy, who has done a lot of very excellent work on uh, the spectrum of normal and abnormal age-related findings. But first, what would be healthy aging? This is a 74-year-old patient. We all have some atrophy as we grow up. It starts at age 30, so I'm already suffering a great deal from cerebral atrophy, uh, no doubt. But if I'm 74 and my brain looks like this, I would be happy. We see some mild cerebral atrophy. If you use the global cerebral atrophy scale or the global cortical atrophy scale, we'd say that this is a great one. And this is okay in a patient uh, of age 74. And also look that it mainly involves the frontal and parietal lobes um, and that the occipital lobes and the temporal lobes are less involved. We can also see that on these coronal images, so the temporal lobe looks rather okay. We mainly see sulcodilatation and atrophy higher up uh, at the level of the frontal and parietal lobes. Also notice that here the occipital lobe, for instance, looks spared compared to the parietal lobe and the frontal lobe in which we see some mild atrophy. 
if we were to use the Kudam scale, oh, so this is GCA1, and if we were to use the Kudam scale for the parietal atrophy, we would also call it a grade one. And when it comes to hypocampal atrophy, well, this patient looks very lucky. It's a CT, but on CP, it looks like a grade zero, and that's perfectly okay. So this would be an example of healthy aging on a CT of the brain. This is a patient who has severe parietal atrophy. If we zoom in, this is knife blade atrophy, and it's quite simple. Knife blade atrophy, you should always consider abnormal, irregardless of the age of the patient. So even if the patient is 85, we don't want to see knife blade atrophy. That's not okay. And that is something you can take with you. If you see knife blade atrophy, it's abnormal. This is end stage atrophy. This is a patient with global cortical atrophy grade 2. Would we consider it normal or abnormal? That's a bit more difficult, but this patient is actually very young. When talking about dementia, we're generally talking about patients who are in their 70s. This is a patient who isn't even 50 yet. Nevertheless, the patient has global cortical atrophy grade 2. And what else does this patient have? He has a lot of cerebellar atrophy. And this gives a clue to the diagnosis. Um, this was a patient with chronic alcoholism, chronic alcohol abuse, which has led to generalized cerebral and cerebellar atrophy. And chronic alcohol abuse is also something to keep in mind when you are confronted with a relatively young patient who nevertheless has a lot of atrophy. Patients will not always admit it. And it's also a bit tricky to suggest it in a report, but you could definitely, if you are discussing the case with your physician, uh, cautiously inform if it's possible that the patient um, consumes a lot of alcohol or not, because in my experience, it is a not infrequent cause of age abnormal atrophy in a relatively young patient. But this is experience based and might have to do with the location in which I'm working. Belgium is a beer country. Um, then we have. Another patient, this patient is aged uh, 57, and the patient also has global cortical atrophy grade 2, uh, mainly involving the parietal lobes, but there is also some involvement of the frontal lobes. And what did this patient have? Well, we also see that there is a lot of widening of the frontal horns of the lateral ventricles, and there is some kind of um, boxcar shape of lateral ventricles, which is a sign you can see in Huntington's disease caused by atrophy of the caudate nucleus. So we have this shape of lateral ventricles caused by atrophy of the caudate nucleus. So final message here, I'm not going to talk more about Huntington, that's for my second presentation, but the message here is, ah, my apologies, uh, that a global cortical atrophy grade two should be considered potentially abnormal in patients under 75. And it can be considered okay in patients above 75. I'm going to stress this once again. We are not trying to generate a specific diagnosis here by using these scales. No, we just want to uh, give an estimate on the degree of atrophy and if we can consider it normal or abnormal or not. We are just providing pieces of the puzzle. Uh, then we have another patient. We have two patients. This is a patient aged uh, 57 years old. And what do we see? We see asymmetrical atrophy involving the right parietal lobe. And asymmetrical atrophy is never abnormal. In this patient, it was caused by a neurodegenerative disease called corticobasal degeneration, which is one of the Parkinson plus syndromes. And in this patient, look carefully, look at the region of the hippocampus, there is a lot of widening. The hippocampus is not uh, visible in this imaging plane, but there is a lot of dilatation of the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle. It's very asymmetrical compared to the other side. And also look at the temporal neocortex. If you look on the right side, it looks, well, a bit atrophic, but not as severe as on the right side. And this was a patient with frontotemporal lobar degeneration. Key message here is if you see asymmetrical or focal atrophy, that should always be considered abnormal and you should try to find a cause or you should at least think about possible causes for the asymmetrical atrophy. Now, mesiotemporal lobe atrophy, what is normal, what is abnormal? Um, what is a normal spectrum? Well, uh, between 30 and 50, we use about 0.2% of volume in the mesiotemporal region per year. In the mid-70s, that has increased to 
eight percent and our eight and nine is even to two to three percent we cannot visually detect accelerated degeneration uh, so we can just use the uh, medial temporal lobe atrophy scale to say at this specific time uh, the patient has mild to moderate or very severe medial temporal atrophy by using this scale but Nevertheless, we want to be able to say something about whether it is normal or abnormal for the age of the patient. And there are certain cutoffs we can use for that. Uh, these are not one. So what is normal, what is that abnormal? These are not 100% sensitive or specific. And there are several studies who have made several suggestions. This is a study by Frederick Barkhoff and colleagues from 2011 who suggested to consider mesotemporal lobe atrophy 0 and 1 normal in patients under 75, to consider it normal, uh, to consider mesotemporal lobe atrophy 0 to 2 normal in patients of 75 and older, and to consider 3 and 4 always abnormal. So that could be something you could use, or this is one I use personally uh, by Ferreira et al. in 2015 published, um, if the average MTA scale is one and a half or higher in patients younger than 75, that should be considered abnormal. If your average MTA, MTA scale is two or higher, that should be considered abnormal in patients of 75 and older. And then you have a sensitivity and a specificity of about 80% uh, for both for discriminating normal from abnormal uh, mesotemporal atrophy for the age of the patient. So this is what I use when uh, evaluating mesotemporal atrophy. So I provide a scale for each lobe separate, separately. Then I make the average and then I re make a reference to this study and say, well, seeing as the patient is younger than 75 and the average MTA scale is two, this should be considered abnormal or is potentially a sign of a neurodegenerative process. So let's practice. This is a patient of 73 years old. This looks to me like MTA grade three, and this looks like MTA grade one. So we have an average MTA of two. The patient is younger than 75, and well, that is too high. And this was a patient with Alzheimer's disease, but also clinically suspected, and some atrophy is okay. You can have uh, asymmetrical atrophy of the mesotemporal lobe. Mostly it's limited, so this is a bit extreme, but nevertheless, this was clinically Alzheimer's disease and also reported as such. Um, or also, this was the final diagnosis, so I do not give a specific Alzheimer's diagnosis on imaging studies. I just say if it's normal or abnormal. Then we have a patient of uh, 64 years old, and here we have an MTA grade 1 on the right side, but on the left side, there's also a widening of the temporal horn. So this would be grade 2. So this is an, ah, oh, my apologies. So this would be an average MTA score of 1.5, which is too high. It's borderline, but it's too high in a patient younger than 75. And this is a relatively young patient. And this was also a case of Alzheimer's disease, but starting at a young age. Now, in some cases, you can actually see uh, accelerated atrophy. This was a study performed for uh, study purposes. Um, so this uh, patient received a lot of MRIs because he was included in a study on Alzheimer's disease. And just look at the uh, hippocampi on both sides and try to look at the choroid fissure and the temporal horns as we systematically move in time. We make jumps of about two to three months each time my apologies, this is, it's my mouse. Uh, so, okay, let's do that again. Okay, and let's move on. Another three months later, another three months later, still another three months later, and we're not finished yet. So this was the baseline study, and we have already moved like one year in time, and we're moving with three months each time. So I hope you kept looking at the choroid fissure and temporal horn. So this was the baseline study. And what do we see? The choroid fissure has slightly expanded on the right side and more conspicuously on the left side with now also widening of the temporal horn. So in a matter of uh, about um, two years and a half, medial temporal lobe atrophy has increased in this patient. And we have now reached an average of one and a half, which would be abnormal 
and a patient under 75. So let's move on to the next patient, uh, to the next topic rather. So we have talked about cortical atrophy. Let's now talk about white matter changes. So white matter changes uh, can have a variety of appearances. And for a clinician, it's uh, not very useful if we just say the patient has periventricular leukoariosis, which is a bit of an outdated term. I try to avoid that, but I see it appearing in a lot of uh, reports. Um, unfortunately, or the patient has some signs of microvascular white matter disease, but not further specified. We want to give an estimate on the degree of severity. And when it comes to white matter changes in the brain, one of the things you often hear, but have no scientific basis whatsoever, is one white matter lesion per decade is okay. Whoever said that? Whoever shown it in a study? Nobody has. So I do not know where it keeps coming from. I've heard it a lot, and I'm sure some of you have too, but there's no basis for it whatsoever. This is a study. Oh, my mouse. This is a study by... Uh, Michael Vernoy et al. from 2007. Once again, the Rotterdam group have done spectacular and great studies uh, on this subject. And they demonstrated, and this is something you can use, that after the age of 45, uh, only 5 to 10% of people in the general population have no white matter lesions. So in other words, and this is something I often use, uh, when uh, referring physicians are worrying about one single or even a few white matter lesions in a patient of 55, after the age of 35, practically everyone has at least one white matter lesion. So it should not be an immediate cause for concern. It's part of the normal spectrum of findings you can see as we age. Now, we want to be able to say something useful about white matter changes. And let's start by making a distinction between periventricular white matter changes, which are generally non-ischemic, and deep and subcortical white matter changes, which are generally ischemic in nature. So these are periventricular white matter changes, and these are deep white matter changes. Um, the two are sometimes vaguely defined, but for me, periventricular white matter changes are changes that are immediately adjacent to the ventricles. So I don't want to see white matter between the ventricles and the lesions, and that are, that are also relatively smooth and regular. Uh, Fazekas has introduced a scale to evaluate white matter lesions, and he also made a distinction between the periventricular and the deep white matter lesions. Now, these are examples of periventricular abnormalities. These caps is something we see a lot. Periventricular caps next to the frontal horns of the lateral ventricles. And studies have shown, pathological studies, that these are not caused by microvascular white matter damage. These uh, correspond to an area of more loose myelin or some focal demyelination. And the exact etiology is unclear, but it's just a part of the normal spectrum of aging, periventricular caps. This would be called pencil thin lining, which is also something you can see, some increased signal along the borders of the lateral ventricles, but it's very smooth, very regular, and also very thin. And if it's not so thin, but it's still very smooth and irregular, we call it a smooth halo. And these are, once again, uh, the same patients, but I've magnified it a bit. So these are the so-called periventricular caps. This is pencil thin lining along the borders of the lateral ventricle, so not just around the frontal horns. And this is a smooth halo extending all the way along the posterior horns and the temporal horns of the lateral ventricles. Studies have shown that these are not ischemic. These are not caused by microvascular changes, and these corresponds to areas of ependymal denudation, so loss of the normal ependyma, bordering lateral ventricles, and some focal white matter loss and subependymal gliosis. Uh, and Fazek has made a scale, but I never use it myself because why would I? These are non-ischemic and as a consequence, irrelevant, irrelevant changes. But if you want to, whoops, oh, my mouse, my apologies, but I don't want to start over just because of that, so I'm going to continue. This would be uh, Fazeka's grade one, periventricular caps and pencil thin lining. So this is a grade one for the periventricular Fazeka scale. A smooth halo is a grade two 
And a gray tree is basically an irregular halo. And the irregular halo is more difficult because here you have the possibility that we have basically deep white matter changes which have um, confluenced or basically grown together with, with the periventricular halo. So that's a bit unclear, but grade one and grade two are definitely non-ischemic in nature. And periventricular halos can show progression, uh, despite the fact that they are not ischemic, and are generally seen in patients who have some ventriculomegaly. Um, and it's especially in these patients that these halos can progress or become wider. And these are several patients. It's not an evolution in time. These are three separate patients, but all of them have definitely moderate enlargement of the lateral ventricles, which is accompanied by a halo bordering the ventricles, um, the entire surface of the ventricles. Now, the deep white matter lesions are more important for evaluating a patient with cognitive impairment or possible dementia. And then we have the Fazekas grade one scale, which refers to some small punctate lesions. And then we have the Fazekas grade two scale, in which we have partially confluent lesions. And that is often in the peritrigonal white matter, deep white matter. And then we have completely confluent lesions, as we can see here. Pathological studies have shown that these punctate lesions are often non-ischemic in nature and often correspond to some gliosis along perivascular spaces. So I would not uh, be too early to call those microvascular changes. I just described them. I say, I see several small punctate white matter lesions and I give the Fazeka scale grade one. And my referring physician, a neurologist, if he's familiar with dementia, uh, he knows that these are can actually be ignored or are not that important in an elderly patient. Grade two and grade three, however, and this has been demonstrated in pathological changes are caused by chronic microvascular disease. These are areas of gliosis caused by chronic hyperperfusion of the deep white matter in patients who have a lipohyalinosis of the penetrating and perforating arteries supplying the deep white matter. So these actually correspond to microvascular white matter damage. And there has been a study once again performed in Rotterdam, the so-called Laudi study, who also uh, demonstrated that in patients with moderate and severe microvascular white matter changes, so Fazekas grade two and grade three, there is a higher chance of becoming uh, invalidated um, over a period of one year. So there's a higher chance of disability in a patient with grade two and grade three. So this does not mean if you see them in a patient that your patient will uh, develop some kind of disability, cognitive or otherwise. It's just an illustration that these are caused by a pathological process, a pathological process that might be associated with vascular dementia or uh, something else, a higher risk of a stroke, uh, for instance. Um, I do not know what was the point I was trying to make here. Oh yes, this is just a summary. So. To me, what I would consider normal age-related findings, and let's say a patient of 77, would be caps and bands. So the uh, frontal caps and then the halo or the pencil thin lining, and also punctate white matter lesions. These I would consider okay in an elderly patient. I wouldn't give them too much attention. And the Fazekas grade two and grade three changes are most likely microvascular, not always, and a patient that has received pancranial radiotherapy, for instance. These can also be caused by radiation therapy, but uh, let's not go into that. In the majority of patients, they will be microvascular, the majority of elderly patients, and there is um, an association with a higher chance of disability if they are present in a patient, so these are potentially significant in a patient suspected of having dementia. So that's it for white matter changes. Let's move on to silent brain infarctions. So the detection of infarctions in a patient who never had a clinical stroke syndrome. And these are also not that infrequent. And we can see them in the deep nuclei, so that, such as the basal ganglia and the thalamus, or also in the brainstem. And we can also see them in the cerebral cortex. Uh, they are caused by also small vessel disease and uh, generally of the perforating lenticostrate arteries uh, when they are located in the basal ganglia. So this is the main branch of the middle cerebral artery. These are the lenticostrate arteries, and these can be subject to lipohyalinosis, so small vessel disease, degenerative small vessel disease. Uh, 
and when there's an acute occlusion, might lead to a small lacunar infarction, which might uh, not be associated with symptoms, so which might occur uh, clinically silent. And in some cases, these vessels can rupture and cause a microbleed. Uh, we also have penetrating arteries uh, supplying the insula and the subinsular white matter, and we also have penetrating or perforating arteries supplying the deep white matter. And in the deep white matter, chronic disease of these penetrating arteries will mo more often not cause lacunar infarctions, but more uh, chronic gliosis caused by hyperperfusion, leading to the microvascular white matter changes we've seen uh, just a few minutes ago. Uh, so where can we see silent brain infarctions? There are several brain areas you definitely have to carefully examine. Those would be the basal ganglia and the brainstem, in which we will often see lacunar infarctions. Uh, you should also look at the cerebral cortex. These tend to be very small and can easily be overlooked. And you can also see them in the cerebellum. Don't call them lacunar infarctions because these infarctions are not caused by occlusions of perforating arteries, but are probably ant anterior strokes or caused by occlusion of um, small pile arteries uh, supplying the cerebellar surface. Uh, concerning lacunar infarctions, so this patient had an old hemorrhage and the opercular region over here, that's not that important. Here we see a uh, small CSF filled. Uh, lacune uh, and the basal ganglia on the left side. And we see on flare images that it is surrounded by gliosis. And that's important because we won't see that in a large curve of Robin spaces in the basal ganglia. These are not surrounded by gliosis. And uh, silent lacunar infarctions also tend to be larger than the Virgo Robin spaces. So that can be used as a way to make a distinction with Virgo Robin spaces. And if you look at the coronal plane, these often tend to have a shape that follows the course of a supplying lenticular striate artery, as we can see here. I drew it on here on purpose, but to show you that they often have a course that follows such an artery uh, if you look at it in the coronal plane. Cortical microinfarctions tend to be very small. That's why we call them microinfarctions. Carefully look at your flare images. We see an area of cortical gliosis and the left parietal lobe. And we also see on these situated images that there is some small cortical tissue destruction over here. And I think I added an arrow, yes, just to make it clear. And these are not infrequent and can be seen in up to 36% of asymptomatic elderly patients, but they are not unimportant but they, because they are a sign of cerebrovascular disease, meaning that the patient uh, has a higher risk of having a stroke uh, these were silent strokes, but is also at risk of having a stroke that might unfortunately not be silent. And they are also associated with a higher risk of vascular dementia. Then we have cerebellar infarctions, which are generally very small wedge shape or linear infarctions. They are most common in the posterior lobes of the cerebellum and generally involve the gray matter or the cerebellar cortex. And they are seen in about 11% of asymptomatic elderly patients, patients who never have a clinical stroke syndrome. So they are definitely not infrequent. And at the beginning of the presentation, I've shown you this uh, variety of sequences we do in elderly patients. And you might have noticed that there's a T2 and a flare. Why the combination of the T2? Uh, why do we need the two? Well, look at these flare images. I'd say these look, well, nothing abnormal is to be seen here. But look at the T2 weighted images of the left cerebellar lobe. We see a small older infarction over here. Oh, my apologies, my mouse. We see a small lacunar infarction in the brainstem over here, and also a lacunar infarction in the brainstem. Uh, right paracentrally and the pons over here. And these are not visible on flare images. Why is that? A bit unsure, but probably because the clefts or the small areas of tissue destruction are filled with fluid that is slightly flare hyperintense, making them iso-intense to the normal brain parenchyma and invisible on flare. That's just my theory. I don't know if it's true. But it also illustrates why you definitely need to look at your T2-weighted images to detect these old lacunar or these old silent infarctions, because you might miss them if you only look at your flare images. So let's move on to the next topic, enlarged pedovascular spaces. I'm going to brief about that. 
you can see them in the elderly. And if you look at elderly brains, you will notice that you see them better and you see more of them than in younger patients. They can be very pronounced in the area of the basal ganglia and the thalamus like in this patient, but you can also see them in the deep white matter. And what are virkov robin spaces? Well, basically these are fluid-filled spaces surrounding small arterioles, capillaries, and venules. Uh, gen of the perforating and penetrating arteries can be the lenticostriate arteries, those insular arteries, or these medullary arteries supplying the deep uh, brain parenchyma or the deep white matter. The function of these perivascular spaces is not well established, uh, but they might be some kind of lymphatic system of the brain and play a role in waste removal in the brain. Um, some authors also contribute a role uh, to them in neurodegenerative diseases. So these are caused by an accumulation of abnormal proteins and several diseases. And this accumulation might be because these normal abnormal proteins are not cleared by the lymphatic system as should be. That's also just a theory. Uh, this is a typical of robin space located basally in the lenticus create territory. Uh, we also see a small vessel coursing through it. There's a small uh, lenticular create artery over here. And in the coronal plane, these are magnified coronal images. These are typically located basally. Um, and uh, here we see some perforating lenticular create arteries. No, these are very small perivascular spaces surrounding lenticular create arteries. And then this is a focally enlarged one. Uh, and you can, as said, sometimes see the vessel in very large ones. And we can also see that over here in this magnified high-resolution T2-weighted image. Uh, there are typical locations for uh, virchow robin spaces. They can be located in the deep white matter. And these are caused by enlargement of perivascular spaces uh, surrounding penetrating medullary arteries. These are sometimes called type 1 virchow robin spaces. Uh, they are typically found in the region of the basal ganglia, especially basally in the basal ganglia region. These are called type 2. They are also, another typical location would be in the mesencephalon or the midbrain, especially in the cerebral peduncle. These are so-called type 3. Uh, and lastly, we have type 4, which are located sub in the subinsular white matter or anteriorly and the temporal lobes. These are sometimes forgotten, but also a typical location for enlarged perivascular spaces. Uh, then we have a special case, the so-called état criblé in French, so the cribbled state, uh, the Swiss cheese striatum. It's a frequent neuroradiological imaging. In the elderly, we see diffusely widened Virchow robin spaces, but all very small. So not just a couple of large ones, but like dozens of very small widened Virchow robin spaces. And there is an association with chronic hypertension and also with the degree of microvascular white matter changes. But the exact pathological significance of this imaging finding is still unclear. That's uh, it's just a term you can use to describe what you see without being able to give an exact pathological correlate or significance. Now, why do work of urban spaces enlarge in the elderly? It's a bit unclear. Several theories could be due to hypertension, could be due to some kind of obstruction at the level of the perivascular space can be due to inflammation or secondary to atrophy. Uh, let's move on to the next topic, the presence of microbleeds. To evaluate my microbleeds, we have to look at the two star images or susceptibility weighted images. And what do we see on this study? Once again, by the Rotterdam group, by uh, Michael Vernoy, what do we see that starting at age 70, we will see at least one cerebral microbleed and more than 30% of elderly patients. So this is also not an infrequent finding. It's a frequent incidental finding. So starting at age 70, 30% will have at least one microbleed and about 16 to 17% will have multiple microbleeds. So that's definitely something to keep in mind. It's not per definition an abnormal finding. When is it abnormal? Well. As soon as you start to see multiple microbleeds, you have to look for patterns. And the two main patterns are microbleeds that are mainly located in the lower region, so in the cortex or subcortical white matter. And this is uh, typically seen in cerebral amyloid angiopathy. And notice that the basal ganglia are spared in this patient. 
And the second case would be when you're mainly located in the basal ganglia and the thalami, which is typically seen in hypertensive microbleeds. And also important, you can do several things. You can do T2 star weighted images with a short echo time. You can do them with a longer echo time, in which case you will see more microbleeds, or you can do susceptibility weighted images, in which case you will see even more microbleeds. So the detection rate of microbleeds is strongly influenced by the sequence you need and by some technical factors, like is it the 1.5 Tesla or 3 Tesla? What is the echo time of the T2 star sequence and so on? Finally, pathological, or let's say not call it pathological, uh, accumulation of iron in the basal ganglia, which is typically seen on susceptibility weighted images and T2 star images. In uh, elderly patients, we can see often see that the basal ganglia become dark on T2 star or susceptibility weighted images. And we see here a low signal in the basal ganglia, both in the lentiform nucleus and the caudate nucleus, also in the substantia nigra over here, and the red nucleus and the dentate nucleus. What is the significance? Well, the significance is still unclear. There are several disorders that are associated with abnormal uh, iron deposition, but these are pretty rare. So a uh, neurodegeneration caused by iron accumulation. There are several syndromes, but they are, often have a very specific patterns. Also other abnormalities. Uh, I will not go into that over here. Here, I just want to show you that this is something that you can also see in the elderly and the significance is unclear. And it's also something that starts at an early age. And a study uh, performed and subject of all ages, most signal loss and the globus pallidus, for instance, starts already at an early age and then reaches a plateau phase. And as patients grow older, we can see the development of multiple waves of um, lower signal and the globus pallidus, which are referred to as waves. Uh, and in the putamen, we typically see development of a lower signal caused by iron accumulation starting at the posterolateral aspect of the uh, putamen and then extending all the way to anteriorly and medially. These grades were used for uh, this specific study, also the globus pallidus abnormalities I've shown you, but there's no reason to use it because the pathological and clinical significance of these uh, findings is, as said, still unclear. So what are now my key messages? What do I want you to remember? First of all, if we talk about the global cortical atrophy scale, Global cortical atrophy grade three or knife blade atrophy is always abnormal. A grade two is potentially abnormal or potentially a sign of some disease and neurodegenerative process if you see it in patients under 75. And asymmetrical or focal atrophy should also always be considered abnormal. Concerning the mesotemporal lobe atrophy, I've shown you how to use the mesotemporal lobe atrophy scale. And this is what I used based on the study of Herrera et al. from 2015. And a patient under 75, your average MPA score should be lower than one and a half. And a patient of 75 and older, your average MPA score should be lower than two. So if it's higher than those reference values, you are dealing with potentially abnormal uh, atrophy in the mesiotemporal region. Concerning white matter changes, caps and bands are not ischemic. And well, it should be considered a normal age-related finding. Uh, Faldekat grade scale one is something I described, but I do not point it out specifically if it's not specifically asked of me because it's generally, well, uh, not relevant. And Faldekat grade two and three are very likely microvascular and should be explicitly described and a patient consulting for possible dementia. Then uh, we have some uh, other findings. So silent brain infarction can be seen and up to 30% of the elderly can be located in the basal ganglia, brain stem, uh, cerebral cortex, and uh, the cerebellum. Look at your T2 star and uh, susceptibility weighted images for microbleed. Keep in mind that in patients over 70, more than 30% will have at least one microbleed. And if you see multiple ones, look for a specific pattern, be it lober or uh, central in the deep nuclei. And enlarged work of Robin spaces are seen increasingly in the elderly, but the significance is unknown. And the same is true for signal loss in the basal ganglia. 
on T2 star and susceptibility weighted images caused by iron accumulation. And this is just a slide that if you press pause, uh, you can read in detail. It's just summarizing everything I said. So an at a glance overview of everything that is possibly present in the brain of an elderly patient and should be reported or should definitely be sought after. So that was my first uh, presentation on imaging of the elderly brain. The next presentation will be very specific, uh, showing you cases of patients with abnormal aging due to um, neurodegenerative processes like Alzheimer's dementia. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, please leave a message. Uh, in the comment section or email me neuroradiology.online at gmail.com. And oops, and my apologies for the technical uh, difficulties I had with my mouse. Uh, stay tuned for the next presentation on imaging of the aging brain. And thank you very much for watching.